As you all know, we're in... Living on new terms. Last week we started out and we said that, uh, um, you know, oftentimes life, life kind of says live on my terms, doesn't it? But I think it's time that we step into a season where we look, we look, uh, we look at Satan, we look at his, his, uh, uh, his little force and his army that's come against us, and we say, you know what, it's time that we live on new terms. It's time we live on godly terms, Amen. It's time we live on the terms that God has called us to live on. We approach this by stepping in and breaking some bondage that is over some of our lives. Whether we like it, whether we like to admit it or not, we've all gone through things that cause us to be labeled, right? Sometimes we even label ourselves, and sometimes that's the worst. Insignificant, incomplete failure. Sometimes it's not even what the world labels us that is hard to deal with, but what we put on our own backs, But we stepped in last week and we said, you know what? It's time to stop being labeled falsely. It's time that I reclaim my identity and my calling and I allow God to put a label on my life and I walk out the calling that God has for me. That's the first tool that I decided we needed to equip ourselves with along the way. And then the second tool, we're going to ask a serious question. Because, come on, you guys know I like to hoot and holler with the best of them, but sometimes we got to get practical, and we've got to give tools, and we've got to say, okay, we talked three weeks ago about being wounded, and is there a wound under there? That was awesome, Pastor Mike. Thank you for exposing my wound. And now everybody knows that I've been battered and bruised, right? Can you give me something to get over it, dude? <laughs> you know, just like, Instead of putting me on front street, right? So that's where we are. We're going to ask the question, am I able to forgive? Next week, we're going to look and say, is restoration my destination? I don't know about y'all. I just think it was fun to say, but it makes a good title as well. And then in week four, we're going to ask, is there life after failure? Anybody failed? Anybody? 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 I didn't say fall, KK. (laughs) So today, how many of you have ever had someone hurt you? For every one of us, Um, I was going to say anyone over a particular age, but if you are breathing, you've had somebody hurt you, right? That statement is true for all of us. Somewhere along the way, we carry some sort of offense. We carry some sort of pain. We carry some sort of trial. Uh, We've felt pain from someone, haven't we? Oftentimes, it can be a simple matter of miscommunication that we've failed to address, correct? Oftentimes, it's just that we're, um, well... How do I put this? Uh, Too hard-headed to look at the miscommunication and deal with it. But other times, it's outright blatant betrayal, isn't it? You know you've trusted somebody. You've confided in them. You've married them. You've, you, you maybe were their son or daughter. You had no choice in the situation. Or, or maybe it was a mom or dad, whatever the case may be. And some of us are dealing with present hurt in our lives right now. Some of us are dealing with things that others have done to us in the past, and it's real. And some of us, if we're honest, have suppressed what has happened to us in the past. And some of us are real good at it, aren't you? (laughs) It's one of those messages where you start calling, I'm not going to call you out by name, no. But we get real good at suppressing things. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to hide. I get real good at suppressing things sometimes. It's easy to push down the pain that's been caused to you and put a smile on and try to go on about your life in a normal manner. But something seems to happen, doesn't it? We talked about this briefly in the uh, what are you hiding under their uh, message when I talked about being wounded. There's a trigger point. Just like there is with alcoholism or drug addiction. There's a trigger. Something happens and it sends our life back out of control. And the pain comes flooding back in too quickly. And it's all too real. What happened to us is very vivid in my mind. And I know it's like it just happened to me. It could be a year ago. It could be three years ago. It could be two, uh, two decades ago. But there's that little trigger that hits. And all of a sudden, man, it's real. And it's right now. And there's always that person around you that want to say, get over it. It was two decades ago, right? Get over it. And you always want to say, if my hands could fit around your neck without, right? And you're sitting there thinking that. You're thinking, goodness, I'm going to have to ask for forgiveness again. In other words, what I'm trying to get to us today is that we all deal with hurt on some level or another 
And I think it's probably safe to say in here today that every one of us are dealing with some kind of hurt in some manner, somehow in our lives. The question we must ask ourselves is this, not whether we're hurting or not or whether or not we've been insulted or whether we've been offended, but do we deal with that pain biblically? Are we healing biblically? Are we moving on biblically? Are we sitting back fleshly and staying in the patterns that we've always been? The Bible says this in Mark eleven twenty five. 25. It says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your father in heaven may forgive your sins. I, I, I like what, what Mark does here. Uh, instantly what he does is he says, if you hold anything against anyone, you need to forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive your sins. There's a contingency to the factor in what he's saying to us. In other words, we've come forth in a place of worship and we're seeking God in a place of worship. And, and right, most often times we come and we're worshiping and, and, and we're going through the, you know, pray, repent, ask, yield sort of prayer pattern. And, and at some point we're asking God to clothe our sins that we've committed. If you're doing the Lord's prayer, which should be called the disciples' prayer. But if you're doing the Lord's prayer in that pattern, it shows us to ask for forgiveness in that method, kind of in that model of how we pray. But what Jesus is saying and what Mark recorded for us so eloquently is that if you come and you come to a place of asking your Father in heaven for forgiveness, you as well must forgive someone else. You must seek out somebody to forgive the hurt in which they had brought against you. Now listen, whenever we talk about something like this, there will always be the person that says this statement. You don't know what so-and-so has done to me. You don't know how they have wronged me. You don't know what they did. You don't know what they put me through. You don't know where I've been. And you're right, I don't know what you faced. I don't know what you've been through. And I don't know who you faced, quite frankly. Because some people are scary, aren't they? Help me, Jesus. Come on, somebody better testify in here. I think that other chair was about to fall apart. (laughs) right? Some people are scary sometimes. What I do know is this. It's okay for you to move on. It's okay for you to let go of where you have been. I do know this as well. It's not always easy for you to let go. It's not always easy just to let God have it, is it? Come on, somebody. It's not always just to say, God, here, you got it. God, it's yours. Because like I preached when we were talking about uh, can I trust the process, we remember the story of Joseph. Because the scars for Joseph wasn't necessarily about the rocky crag that scarred him or that cut him on the way down. The pain came from the person who pushed, right? The scar was a reminder not of how far he fell into the pit, but who put him in that pit. And for some of us in here today, we have that very vivid memory. We've healed from the wound, but that scar is a constant reminder of who put me there in the first place. I don't know what offense you deal with. I don't know if someone gossiped about a secret that you shared with them, if it was drug-related or alcohol-related, if somebody has harmed you or a family member through that, if a spouse has cheated on you, if you've been taken advantage of, if a, a mom or a dad or a, or a son or a daughter has betrayed your trust or stolen from you, a family member has molested somebody or in this room in the past, and the list continues to go on and on. Hurt from the people that we love is hard. And you know, sometimes it's not just about the hurt that happens to me, is it? Sometimes it's about the hurt that happens to my family members. I'm a person of thick skin. You can come at me, you can talk about me, you can gossip about me, you can lie about me. People have, and they've probably done the same thing to you, right? But come after my wife or my babies, you got a whole other thing going down, right? Scrape my name off the front door real quick because we're about to have a talk, right? Come on, somebody. Look, you want to throw some blows? Come at me. But when you start attacking the family, it gets different, doesn't it? You know what you're saying? You're like, don't call me Pastor Mike, right? You can just call me Mike because we're about to have a real issue right here. And you guys know what I'm talking about. That pain is hard to deal with. And sometimes forgiving someone who has offended your son or your daughter or your mother or your brother or your sister or your aunt or your uncle is some of the hardest pain we will ever have to forgive. And so what I want to do right now is I want to have a moment of prayer for us because we're going to have a tough conversation today about letting that forgiveness rise up in our hearts and letting that bitterness that's inside of us go. Because somewhere all of us deal with some 
portion of it in our lives. Can we pray? Father, we just thank you in this moment that we've come together with you in your house. God, I, I thank you that we come together as the Acts 13 assembly and we are gathered together as the church. God, there are people of different creeds, different backgrounds, uh, different economic uh, standings, God, but we are all here equal at the foot of the cross. And today, God, I pray that you would prick our hearts, God, and as the psalmist said, you would reveal from the depths of within, God, that which lurks in there, God, that which hides, God, and bring it to the surface, God, so that we can deal with it biblically. God, I said deal with it biblically and not easily because, God, quite frankly, some of it's not going to be easy. Quite frankly, some of us don't want to forgive, God. And God, there are seasons of all of our lives, God. None of us, I think, I would, it would probably be safe to say that none in this room are exempt from a season of life where we have not wanted to forgive somebody. But God, I'm praying that today through your words and God, you speaking through your word, through your servant, God, that you would help us to forgive. You would help us to move on. You would help us to heal. So we've all been hurt, right? So the question today is not when we've been hurt, but who's hurt us? Someone at work, a business deal gone bad, mom or dad, son, daughter, aunt, uncle, close friend, husband and wife. Maybe for some of us in here today, it was God who we felt has hurt us. And we're bitter at God and we're bitter at our relationship with God. And maybe if we're really going to be honest in here today, for some of us, we're going to acknowledge that it really wasn't somebody else that hurt us. And it really wasn't God that hurt us, but it was ourselves that hurt us, right? We're bitter not at God. We're not bitter at our spouse, at our children or somebody else, but if we're really going to be honest and give forgiveness this morning, we're going to acknowledge that somewhere along the way, I'm bitter at, well, me. I put myself in a situation I shouldn't have put myself in, and it really wasn't so-and-so's fault. Now listen, I'm not trying to pass off because some of us have to deal with some very real stuff because someone else in here has hurt us. The hardest thing for us to do is see you through God's view. You remember last week that was one of the things with relabeling ourselves. It's hard to see me through, through, through God's view, right? Come on. It's real easy to see myself elevated or we get a very low image of ourselves, don't we? Right? It's hard to get that equal ground on where we really are. Sometimes, and the only time that I feel that we can really do it is through the view of God. Because God has a funny way of saying, hold up, you need to pick yourself up, son or daughter. Or oftentimes God will stop by and say, you might need to chillax with that a little bit. You're a little over the top, you know. Anybody? Okay, just me? All right. (laughs) I see how y'all going to do me today. But in this type of conversation, we need to grasp something that what is impossible with you and I is very possible with the Lord God. It is my prayer today, and it's been my prayer in thinking about this message, is the Holy Spirit would allow forgiveness to raise in our hearts and to break us free. The big question we have to ask ourselves is, why should I forgive? Why should I forgive? And the answer is kind of easy if you just think about it. Unforgiveness is poisonous to me. The Bible said this in Hebrews 11, or rather 12 and 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. We know what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 and 15, correct? The Bible says love keeps no records of wrong, but we all know on the flip side, right, that bitterness keeps a detailed record, doesn't it? When someone wrongs me, I know how they wronged me. I know where they wronged me. I know what time it was. I know what I was wearing, right? I know what what my neighbor six blocks down the road was wearing, right? I know what was happening. I have a record of the offense that came against me. Bitterness comes in and keeps a detailed record of where we are and it does so by becoming a a root of bitterness in our life and what it does is it hurts our relationships with others but watch furthermore what it does is it hurts our relationship with God because there's bitterness in our heart there's strife in our heart and unforgiveness in our life becomes a cancer to our spiritual person it seems to be hidden underground until that moment It grows and it grows and it grows until something triggers us and allows it to surface like that little 
that little plant on a, on a warm spring day that finally breaks ground, there is that thing that we've been harboring all that time. I believe Anne Lamont said it best when she said, unforgiveness is like drinking rat poison, hoping that the other person will die. All right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. But how often do we allow somebody to run the track in our mind over and over and over and we look at their life and we keep thinking this thought. And you don't have to raise your hand if you've had this thought. You can just affirm in your own mind, how dare they move on with their own life while I'm still suffering from what they've done to me. That's what Anne Lamont said. Unforgiveness is drinking rat poison, hoping that the other person will die. Craig Rochelle said something interesting. I, I heard him, he said that, Unforgiveness is like taking a handful of broken glass and squeezing it in my hand, hoping that it will inflict pain on the other person. But I think the words of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. will help us to understand today something. Goodness gracious. It says, forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a constant attitude. Wow, how true that may be for us today. Martin Luther King Jr. went on to say something else. He said, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. Wow. So why should I forgive? You will need forgiveness in the future. The Bible said in Matthew 6, 14 through 15, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, watch, Matthew's a little more blatant here than Mark, wasn't it? Mark was kind of suggestive when we read from his gospel. Matthew's not so suggestive, is he? Matthew goes on, he says, your father will not forgive your sins. That's pretty like, whoa, hold up, whoa. So in other words, what Matthew's saying to us is if we walk around in our life holding unforgiveness in our life, literally, God is holding unforgiveness for us as well. Because the pattern, the key to unlocking forgiveness in my life, I mean, according to the word of God, right? I have to preach the word of God. I have to, I have to speak what the word says, the word of God says. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Wow. You may recall the, the, the servant who owed his master 10,000 talents, right? Now listen, 10,000 talents may not seem like a lot in our society and where we are. And, and I know that, that thousands of dollars is, is nice to have in our bank account. But 10,000 talents, what would that be really for us? That was like 20 years of wages for this man. And he came before his master who was ready to imprison him and ready to, to jail him until he had paid off his debt. How many knows you can't pay off your debt while you're in jail, while you're in bondage? You can't work it. That's why Jesus Christ came to pay for our sins because we could not afford to pay for our own sins in bondage. And so this, this, this servant goes to his master and he says, please forgive me of my debt. Please, I have no way to repay you. I, I can't do it. There's, there's no way. That's, that's 20 years of wages. There's no way that I could ever do that in a place of bondage. And so the master does what? He forgives the servant. He wipes the slate completely clean, the same as Jesus Christ has done for you and I. He wipes the slate completely clean. Now, as Jesus tells this parable, and this servant is released from jail and released from the potential judgment of the master, what happens? He goes back to his home, and he goes along walking along his way. And what happens? The root of bitterness grows in him because he sees someone that doesn't owe him 10,000 talents, that doesn't owe him 20 years of wages, but he sees a man who owes him simply one day's, one day's worth of wages. And he says, you will pay me what you owe me. And the other man's like, oh man, forgive me, wipe my debt clean, man, help a brother out, man, come on. It was just one day, haven't you had any mercy? Haven't you had any grace in your life? Come on, man, we've been boys from way back. We've been friends from grade school. And he's like, nope, it's not happening, right? Come on, you guys know what I'm talking about. He says, there's no way, no how. The master catches wind of what's going down, and the master called the servant in. And listen to the words that the master said. He said, you wicked servant. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had on you? 
In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Goodness, Matthew was blunt. He's not making like any like just trying to be nice about it. Like maybe you should forgive a little bit. He was well, Jesus said it. He was just the messenger, right? You guys are going to resonate with this. It's easy to embrace my forgiveness. If I need forgiveness, I want you to forgive, right? If I've done something wrong and, and I don't want you to be mad at me anymore, or I want to, you know, let's just move on and be chums, or let's forget about it, you know, water under the bridge, you know, duck over the, or, or water over the duck's back, whatever the case may be. I want to receive that for, for water goes over the duck's back. Have you ever seen a duck? Good night. I did not make it up. My grandpa used to say that. <laughs> he probably made it up. <laughs> but right, my forgiveness is easy for me to embrace. But it's not always easy for me to embrace forgiveness for somebody else. My forgiveness is easy for me to embrace. But it's not always so easy for me to embrace offering forgiveness to someone else. Oh, there's a verse for you guys. How do I forgive someone who hurt me? The first step to forgiving those who have hurt you is to pray for those who hurt you. Now, listen. Some of y'all are like, the vengeance is the Lord's, and you're thinking like, you know, I've heard that kidney stones are real bad, and so, you know, I'm going to pray for my brother in Christ, you know. I'm going to pray for my sister. I'm going to pray for a kidney stone or a gallbladder, or I'm going to pray that they don't make it to the hospital in time for their epidural. Abby, I'm praying you do. Abby has not offended me in any way, by the way. <laughs> Everybody's like, dang, she did him wrong. <laughs> she did him dirty. Liz made it with no epidural for, for Bryce. It was good. I recommend it. <laughs> Every woman out there in Facebook lands like, I'm teasing. A childbirth was. <laughs> Somebody say skirt, skirt. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> but it's real easy for us to begin to pray, God, let them get what they deserve, Right? God, they harmed me, they hurt me, they, they did me wrong, Lord, and the vengeance is yours, Lord God. I don't want to defile my hands, Lord Jesus. I don't want to get my hands dirty, God, because you said vengeance is yours. So I'm going to let you do your thing, Lord Jesus, and you, you go ahead and you bring, you bring some tribulation on them. But the pattern in praying for somebody that hurts us isn't quite like that, is it? The pattern in praying for somebody that hurts us is that man named Jesus who came and walked for 33-ish years on this earth. And he gave us a pattern to pray for others. He said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them who have come after my life and won't stop until I've died. Forgive them who laugh at me and mock me and call me a blasphemer, Lord God. Forgive them who call me a false prophet and a false teacher, God. Forgive them who say my ministry isn't real and who simply try to write me off as the son of Joseph or the son of a carpenter, God, or a sinner or a madman or those who call me a lunatic. Forgive these people, Lord God. Forgive these at this point as he's hanging on the cross. Forgive them who have scoffed at me and and more than just scoffed and come at me mentally, Lord God, but, they, but they've tied me to a whipping pole and they've beat me and they've tormented me. Forgive them who have spared me in the side. Forgive them who have spat upon me. Forgive them who have took a spear and stuck me in the side. This is Jesus, y'all. This is the pattern he's showing me. I don't know anybody in here who's had it worse than Jesus had it. And Jesus puts down this pattern of prayer and he says, forgive them as they, as, as forgive them, Lord God. Forgive them for they know not what they do, as a matter of fact. Isn't it interesting that while he is hurting, he is literally bleeding out. He is literally suffering in the moment. We're not talking a few decades down the road where he's had time to get some counseling, right? Hey, we're not talking about the, my brother's on uh, 20 milligrams of his favorite pill. No, no, no. He's in the moment. He's in real time, real life, saying, Father, forgive them for they, they know not what they do. Father, forgiveness is what he's offering these people who he could have called. He is fully God, yet fully man. He could have called down angels and dispatched his freedom in that moment, but he didn't do it. He prayed for forgiveness. 
Look at what Jesus taught very plainly in Matthew 5 and 43. He said, he said, you've heard it said. In other words, this was kind of a popular teaching in their time. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and do what to your enemy? Most people would say hate them because that's what's normal, right? That's what's normal in our society. We see it all over. We see, we see hate groups rising up to show and display their hate because somebody has a different color skin than they have or somebody comes from a different background than they come from or somebody this or somebody that. And, and there's just hate just breeding for, for no reason most of the time. We hate people for the, the craziest things, don't we? And, and we see it all over Facebook. We see it all over. We see hate for, for other Christians and, and brothers of Christ. Christ and sisters of Christ rising up. We see it on social, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram. We see it on the, on, the, on the news. I mean, we see it in our family. If you don't have any of those accesses, we see it in our workplaces and our families, right? Hate other people who do us wrong is what is common. And as a matter of fact, for the Romans, whom Jesus, who would have heard the words of Jesus or would have got out to him anyway, you know, they know. They, they, they worshiped revenge, Revenge was literally a god to the Romans. Hate those who have done you wrong. The Jews taught something very, very similar. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. In other words, if somebody steals from you, you take their hand. You've heard it said. What Jesus was saying and where Jesus was going would have been pretty normal to the people to, of his day. But he steps in with something revolutionary. Something shocking, something that would have floored them. And he says this, and it's recorded in verse 44. But I tell you, pray for them. Pray for those who persecute you. <laughs> and chances are, as I read that verse to some of you guys, because the same thought clicked in my mind, yes, holy pastor, bishop, Mike Collier, the thing clicked in my mind when I read that the other day was, I don't want to forgive some people sometimes, right? Right? That clicked in my mind. I was like, oh, Jesus, help me. I got to get saved again, right? And you go, whoa, hold on. I need you to pull something up from the depth of my heart. What's going on in there, God? You know, that's the interesting thing about a message like this. You can't just get up and preach a message like this without God dealing with you. And, and really, I brew on a message all week long. So some of y'all get about 45 minutes of this, and you're out, and you don't have to hear it no more. I've had to deal with this all week. Y'all are lucky. Y'all are lucky. <laughs> Chances are some of you saying, I don't want to forgive. I don't want to pray for them. I don't feel like it. And I understand because I've been there. I maybe have not been in the same circumstance that you've been in. I, I may not be able to say I understand the situation that you've been through. And I may not be able to under say I understand uh, uh, the pain that you feel because I might not have went through the same exact scenario that you've went through. All of us have went through different things in our life. But I can say that I understand sitting in a place and saying I don't want to forgive because I feel like they deserve unforgiveness, right? But all that does is that puts, that, puts that, that, that poison and that bitterness into my life. Watch what the Bible said in Ephesians 4 and 32. It said, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each as Jesus Christ has forgiven you. And so what I've found is oftentimes it takes the right actions to trigger the right feelings. You remember earlier I said that oftentimes we go a long life and all of a sudden something triggers an emotion of unforgiveness in our life, something that we thought we've laid to rest. We're going along just fine, just dandy, and boom, there it is. When we start putting the right actions into place, all of a sudden the right feelings will be triggered and follow along with it. It may just be as simple as saying, Father, so-and-so's name, please help me to forgive them. Or Father, so-and-so's name, bless them. And you do that enough times over and over, and God begins to trigger something in your life. And before you know it, uh, what was a four-word prayer over their life now becomes uh, a 30-second prayer over their life. And what becomes a 30-second prayer moves into a 60-second prayer. And you begin to move from that 60-second prayer into a place of forgiveness for them. I'm not saying that because I come in here and preach to you 40 minutes that the Bible says that we should forgive, that we're going to walk out of here saying, oh man, I feel great about myself. I've forgiven completely today. For some of us, we may have to pray and we may have to steward this prayer that God help me to forgive. God, I need to remove the bitterness from my heart. How many knows that when you got weed, you, you got lawns, some of you guys have gardens and you're in a place where, where, where you got to go out and you, got, you pull that weed, <laughs> right? And those, some of them just come back 
We got this little garden deal right outside of, of our house there, and Bryson calls it his garden. I don't really even know what kind of plants they grow there. They're, they're pretty, and they, they grow some flowers, but every year they grow up some weeds. There's some roots in there, and we, we pull them out every year, right? But they come back. Sometimes some things got to be pulled out, and sometimes we've got to go back to what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said. When we have to allow forgiveness to be a constant thing in our life, it has to be habitual. Maybe sometimes it's just hitting our knees and allowing God's prayer and God's word in our life to trigger something. Let me say this. My prayer, your prayer, may not even change the other person. The other person may go on doing the same thing that they've done to hurt you in the first place. But I can guarantee you this. If you hit your knees and you seek the Lord Jesus Christ and you seek Holy Spirit to move in your life, while your prayer may not change them, I guarantee it will change you. Don't believe me? Try it for 30. Try it for seven days. I was going to say 30, but Holy Spirit prompted me to say seven. Don't, don't play me, Holy Spirit. <laughs> no, I, just try it. Pray for those who hurt you. So how do I forgive someone who has hurt me, Pastor? Forgive as you have been forgiven. Forgive as you have forgiven. I encourage you today to forgive as you have been forgiven. So how do I forgive? I mean, how do I do that? The same way that God has forgiven us. He sent Jesus. Now, don't send your son, but he sent Jesus to forgive us of our sins. Some of y'all are like, go take, go deal with this for me, boy. You're going to have to go die for that. <laughs> help, help daddy out. But the type of love and compassion that would cause Jesus to do such a thing. How do I forgive completely? How do I forgive, Pastor? As Christ has forgiven you. And that is completely. You too can forgive in the same way. But watch this, what the Bible says in Colossians 3 and 13. It says, bear with each other and, well, hold on a second, I just got to stop there. Because some of us are going to have to bear with some folks as we try to forgive them, right? How many of you know y'all got to bear along with some folks sometimes? You're trying to give them forgiveness and they're just, they're just giving you that same thing back and you're thinking, my goodness, I'm trying to allow my spirit man to rise and you causing the flesh man to rise. Man, you're trying to talk to the old me and this is, I'm trying to give you the new me. I'm trying to offer you forgiveness, right? Come, okay, okay. Oh, y'all gonna do me like that. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. If the worship team would come for me this morning. You've heard the statement, and I didn't have this in my notes anywhere, but uh, you've probably heard it. I think it was brought up in our um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Leaders. I think we went through it. And it says that hurting people hurt people. And sometimes I, 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 I hate that statement in a sense because sometimes it seems like such a cop-out. Uh, but it's true, isn't it? When somebody's hurting, they oftentimes lash out. They say that, that most animals that attack, um, if you read about them, they don't attack until they are cornered or they feel threatened, and then they lash out. Have you found that to be the same thing that's true in your life? Sometimes I don't lash out, Pastor, until I feel threatened. I don't lash out until I've been triggered. I don't lash out until the pain has surfaced and I just can't take it anymore. But on the opposite side of that, the Bible would lead us to this narrative that the forgiven forgive others. And it just kind of occurs to me where we've been lately and what we've been going through and, and kind of our growing pains or whatever we call them. That we deal with things in life and sometimes we've got to just be able to forgive. Sometimes things happen. Sometimes we need to acknowledge that it's not always the person that hurt us that is really at fault. It's the spiritual warfare that's at play. And if we're truthful this morning, we don't always want to acknowledge that, do we? Right? We want to hold on, hold on a second. I'm not playing that spiritual warfare stuff today. 
you did me wrong and you need to pay. And we're not going into spiritual warfare so much in the moment. Well, I mean, we are, I guess. Forgiveness is it. Because this is going to be a struggle for some of us. But sometimes we need to acknowledge that, that the enemy has got a hold of somebody. The enemy has used their weakness or what that person has been through, the enemy has used and distorted our weakness to allow that to come against us. And so I understand this morning that forgiveness is not easy. There's a lot of things that I've had to deal with silently and all by myself. And there's a lot of things that you'll have to deal with silently and all by yourself. Yes, my position may be a little different because I'm a pastor. But I'm flesh and blood just like you. I hurt and I bleed. I go through trials and I go through pains. But I'm thankful for a Savior named Jesus Christ. Who said, you know what? I know you're going to go through a thing. And I'm not going to ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. And I just think about Jesus on that cross, battered, bruised, bleeding, blood running down in his eyes. He probably can't even see his adversary at the moment. And yet he calls out to heaven. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That leads me to that place of spiritual warfare. I'm not telling you to go put, get back in the dog cage with the dog that bit you. I'm not saying to stick your hand back in the cage. Sometimes we can forgive and not get back in the cage, right? If you've pushed a snake into a corner, don't, don't, don't forgive it and go push it back, right? Because it's going to lash back out. But we can stop drinking the poison that caused us to be in the pain that we're in. Today we can stop the cycle of poison. Because the fact of the matter is, if we're walking around with unforgiveness in our life, the one who is poisoned is you, isn't it? And today if the one who is poisoned is you, you can walk out of this place with the antidote. And I think that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave it to us, didn't he? He said that it's forgiveness. I'm going to jump back to that slide. Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It's a constant attitude. We d must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. In Matthew 18, 21 through 22, the Bible said, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And Luke in 6 and 28, the Bible tells us to bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Today, what I want to do is have a very real moment with us, and we're going to say goodbye to our online community. We thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you. Uh, in-house next Sunday, if possible. Uh, we know that many of you are ill or can't travel, and so we are always gracious to have you, and we send blessings to you. We hope that today's message has touched you, and we ask you to share it. Go on our page and share it. But as we sit here in this moment with those who are in-house,